Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. This is our second power hour. Last week was lots of fun. It was a very informative session by Dr. Harlem Gunness. And this one is certainly going to be the same. I think you're gonna enjoy it. For some of you who may not know me, my name is Susan Damiani and I am the director of gift planning as well as the director of the McCall Society which is our St. John's Legacy Society. And today we're going to have an interesting conversation with Owen Duffy. Owen is the director of the Ye Art Gallery, which is located in Sun Yat-sen on the Queens campus. Uh, how are you doing today, Owen? Uh, I'm doing great. How are you coping? You look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm doing the best that I can, all things considered. Yeah. Um, you know, it's yeah. I'm, I'm I'm in Maryland at the moment. I'm staying at my in-law's place. Great, you um, escaped. You escaped yeah, from yeah. New York City. Not a bad, not a bad move. <laughs> yeah, well, after they, you know, St. John's um, you know, closed its campus, I decided, you know, I could be somewhere closer to family with more space. So, um, I came yeah. from here and. Um, uh, did the full 14 day quarantine in the basement, so no contact okay. with the outside right. world. So, so I following know the sick, rules, following very the proud. Rules. <laughs> um, and yeah, and you know, it's things have been good. And of course, I'm just you know, watching the situation with great anticipation, looking forward to mm -hmm. when we can all be hopefully back together uh, at St. John's. Well, I'm just happy to see you very healthy. Yeah. Uh, so that's good. We want that's what we want to see. Well, let's get started. Um, let me first introduce uh, you to Owen of all this great information about him. He is a curator. He is an active art historian and a writer. And a lot of his works have been published in many of the major art outlets. Uh, he's earned his PhD in art history from the Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Owen has been with us uh, just a year. Is today your anniversary? Uh, last week was. Ah, oh, happy so, anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. I made it one whole year. I'm really excited. Um, I'm not surprised. Yeah, I'm not I mean, surprised. This will probably be the first of, you know, in line with everyone else, uh, of hopefully many decades. But, um, right. you know, it, it's been really wonderful. And uh, St. John's clearly has such a great community. And I already feel a part of it. Um, oh, that's so. great. Well, I, it seems like decades because <laughs> Owen and I, I feel like we connected immediately, yeah. like we were yeah. right on yeah. the same page. Owen is very enthusiastic. I went to him and said, you know, what can I do to, to bring the gallery to, uh, to everyone um, who's sitting at home, quarantined, and, um, you know, we want to, we want to bring things to life. We want to, you know, help people, they may be bored, we want to learn something new. I have to say, uh, when we did the test run last week, it was, you know, that's art, right? You put the art up on the screen and I just immediately felt relaxed. Anxiety, <laughs> whatever I'm feeling was gone. And I felt, I, I say this in my message, um, that's going to be followed up uh, with this power hour. But I said, I felt like I was in a museum and I just pretended I was in New York. <laughs> and I just like, you know, pretended I was far, far away from all this craziness. And it really was just so wonderful. I felt terrific. So oh, I want everyone here that has um, signed on today. I hope you have the same feeling uh, because that's the whole purpose of our power hours. And I named it power hour because I want to re-energize everyone. And it's just great for everyone to be on board here today and that we're all connected, uh, even though it's through the computer. And um, I have to say, when I see people's names, I get a little choked up. I get emotional <laughs> because, you know, you don't realize it's been, you know, a while, you know, since you've seen everyone. So to me, it's, you know, just to spend an hour with all of you is really exciting and it's really nice and it's very comforting. So I want to thank you again, Owen, without hesitation. You were like, okay, I'm on. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Terrific. So I'm going to turn it over, I guess the screen, not the floor. Screen over to Owen. And sure. um, wait till you see what he has to show you. It's really great. Thank you. All right. So let's give me a second. PowerPoint. Great. Here we go. Everyone. 
everyone see it okay? Susan, looks good to you. Thumbs up. All right. Um, great. Um, well, uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Susan, for that wonderful introduction. My name is Owen Duffy, I'm the director of the A Art Gallery at St. John's University. And as Susan mentioned, I've just made it to my one year mark at St. John's. Um, it is a very different <laughs> world, of course, than when I started a year ago. But, you know, I'm really thankful for this opportunity to share what the gallery does with all of you, albeit virtually, um, and also, you know, create a really great, hopefully, a program for you all. Uh, over the course of this power hour. Um, and so when I was thinking, when Susan approached me about this talk, um, what I really wanted to do was share from my experiences what, um, how I know that artists have, you know, in various times of crisis throughout history, really come to terms with, uh, you know, with the, the, the challenges that they're facing and have offered really help, hopeful messages uh, to, you know, audiences, you know, all across the world and at different points throughout history. And, you know, when thinking about how I can make this relevant to our current moment is I, you know, I, I think the two things that are on everybody's mind, of course, is the pandemic, right? This giant public health question that we're all facing together. And at the same time, you know, the economy, right? These two things are hand in hand. So what I really wanted to do was actually create a, uh, a presentation that looks at how artists have come to terms with, you know, really, uh, you know, seismic events in relationship to public health and in relationship to the economy and have offered cre uh, creative messages of hope uh, for, for visitors that they've put out there in the world. Because I think <clears throat> what we're going to be able to see is, you know, with a little bit of historical distance and to a degree we're even seeing this now, is artists are actually, um, you know, have, uh, will respond to what we're all going through right now. And I think it will be really interesting to take a little bit of historical distance and look back on this current moment and see how artists respond. So without further ado, um, you know, and obviously, you know, there's, there's, there's really strong comparisons, you know, this is what we're experiencing is and for a lot of, uh, you know, for all, all intents and purposes is the plague. And so historically artists have been incredibly involved in creating work that relates to the plague. And for instance, one of the works that immediately I've been thinking about ever since, you know, this is all, you know, the world has changed was this work uh, from the early German Renaissance around the turn of the, the 16th century by a German artist, Renaissance artist named Matthias Grunwald. And um, this is uh, his Eisenheim altarpiece. Uh, the work is currently at the, in, in France right now, but it was created in, in then Germany. Um, and this is a really interesting work because I find it so relevant to what it is that people are collectively going through uh, today. And when creating the Eisenheim altarpiece, Matthias Grunwald um, basically was commissioned by a group of Abatine monks. So they were our, um, Antony monks, excuse me, um, who were followers of St. Anthony. And basically they ran what essentially was a sick hospital for people who were suffering from the plague. They were suffering from um, uh, skin ailments um, and these sorts of things. So they actually went ahead and approached Grunwald and they commissioned him to make an altarpiece. And so this is the altarpiece that he created for this um, hospital that was run by uh, monks who are followers of St. Anthony. And so what we're looking at here is it's called a Pestkreuz. Um, this is the outside of the, the altarpiece and we see Christ here, you know, crucified. And the Pestkreuz is actually a German term for plague cross. And this altarpiece um, was actually constructed and displayed um, in the main hospital where patients would be lying on their bed. You know, they'd be lying down, not unlike Christ about to be entombed at the bottom of this, uh, bottom of this altarpiece. And this, looking at this altarpiece, believe it or not, was actually prescribed to the patients in the hospital as part of their treatment, which I think is really amazing. That there was this idea that, you know, of course, they didn't have modern medicine then. They certainly had a lot of faith. Um, they would be actually in the 16th century as part of their treatment and the care they were receiving, they would be looking at this, uh, at this altarpiece. And part of the reason why that was, you know, we can, we can think about why the uh, monks would have prescribed looking at this work as part of their treatment is because it would create a sense of empathy between, you know, for, you know, between the, for the viewers. Right, is they would look at this work and understand that Christ had suffered in the same way that they are in their current moment as they're suffering from the, 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 the plague or 
suffering from uh, a skin ailment or, or something like that. Um, so another thing that's kind of interesting to note about this work um, that I think is really unique um, in a lot of ways is uh, the way that Matthias Grunwald in the creation of the outside of this piece is we notice that these here at the center, these are the panels that we're looking at, right? And these are the, this is the center panel where um, they will actually open up and unfold before us to see um, what's inside. And it's not by accident, some art historians um, have theorized that there's this line that's bisecting, for instance, uh, Christ's uh, arm as he's crucified here. Um, and in the same way that um, it almost go, goes all the way down through Christ's legs as he's about to be entombed. And part of the reason for that is, is it sort of suggests um, you know, a type of virtual amputation to his, his limbs that might actually relate to the medical conditions um, that the, the different patients within the, the, the hospital in Eisenheim would actually be experiencing because as a result of their skin ailments or you know, gangrene or whatever they're experiencing, they might have to have limbs removed. So this was a way of further um, illustrating and visualizing um, the connections between uh, the patients and viewers as well as the work. So I think that this is really interesting to think about how historically, uh, you know, in different ways, artists have been really, really important in creating visual images that end up having a tremendous impact on um, and are actually meant to help heal the sick in some ways, um, which I think is kind of really, uh, you know, really interesting to think about in relationship to the current moment. Um, so in addition to continue our conversation that we're having um, about how artists have responded to this idea of the plague uh, was actually, oh, before um, moving on to the next image, actually, I think we should take a second that this is actually on feast days um, and holy days. This is actually the way that the, uh, the altarpiece would look when it was opened up to, uh, to uh, patients in the hospital. And of course, this is very, this is a gold, um, gold leafed polychrome relief sculpture uh, that, you know, opens up as the center of the altarpiece. And it's meant to be incredibly magisterial, have it incredibly, um, it's because it's so overwhelming in terms of its visual beauty um, on uh, uh, the, the patients in the hospital in Eisenheim. Um, at the center seated um, is St. Anthony um, that we're looking at here. Um, and then there's also on the left and right panel, there are scenes from St. Anthony's life, um, including when he went and ventured out into the desert to be, um, you know, to be a hermit and was tempted by the devil and to the right where he was undergoing hallucinations um, as, you know, as a result of uh, his isolation and temptation by the devil. So here we, you know, see again, this was, would, would, you know, the altarpiece would generally be closed and that's how people would understand, you know, would, would generally experience the work because they're mostly meditating on Christ. And then on high days, high feast days, holy days, um, the monks would open the altarpiece. And of course, if we have to, whenever I'm teaching in a, you know, in a survey class with, you know, my freshman students or something like this, I really ask them, I implore them to take a step back in time and imagine themselves as a 16th century German peasant. You know, perhaps you might be illiterate, um, you've worked really hard your entire life, and, you know, and if you think about it, images are something that are incredibly rare at that time. You know, we're not bombarded with television screens and our cell phones and the internet. So the impact of this altarpiece would have been tremendous. It would have been a complete spectacle in uh, every sense of the word. It would have been absolutely spectacular to experience this uh, altarpiece. And I mean, what we're looking at, it's an altarpiece that's possibly about 12 feet across when it's fully open. So this is large, it's, it's awe-inspiring, and it really would have um, awed and wowed um, the patients under the care of the Antony monks uh, when they're, they're looking at it and, and of course, um, being quite hopeful about their, their hopeful, their hopeful about their healing, right? And ultimately, this is a hopeful message that was offered to to those who are suffering from illness, um, because if Christ could suffer and go through those tremendous trials, so could they. So, as we're moving along in the Renaissance, we're gonna you know skip ahead. We're gonna go down to Italy. Um, we're gonna go to Venice, one of my favorite places, and. Um, we're going to take a look actually um, at uh, one, um, really a really interesting place in Venice. Um, and we're going to look at how in, in Venice and Italy, there is another way that um, religious images could help inspire those who might be suffering from plague. Um, and where we're going is an interesting place called the Scuola Grande di San Rocco. Um, and the reason why I am going to tell you a little bit about the Scuola Grande, which was by and large, it was a confraternity 
that was founded around the turn of the century, around 1500. Um, you know, the confraternity, um, so basically it's a society of lay people who are um, devotees of, uh, of St. Rocco. Um, and the Scuola is there on the left, what you see here. And then a little bit later, there's the church that was affiliated with the Scuola Grande um, was constructed on the right. And so the reason why we're going to be talking about this, um, this place that was devoted to St. Rocco um, is actually because St. Rocco has a really incredible story. And, you know, before going further, I have to thank a St. John's alum named Francis Hines, who's a very talented artist. Francis might be listening in, um, you know, who actually we were exchanging emails and I was sharing some thoughts about how I found the Eisenheim altarpiece to be an incredibly relevant work and beautiful work that, you know, is worth thinking about today. And, and she said, well, do you know the story of St. Rocco? And, you know, I actually wasn't familiar with him because as there, there are quite a few saints. And, um, you know, then I went, and, you know, she told me about the story and it's really incredible. And basically the, the story goes that St. Rocco, um, he was born in France around, you know, we're not exactly sure the exact dates, but 14th century-ish. Um, and he was kind of crossing into Italy and he, uh, you know, and this of course was during the time of the Black Death. And so rather than, um, and he was also an orphan, I believe at the time, and sort of rather than trying to avoid areas that were incredibly, um, that were beleaguered by the plague, he decided that he actually wanted to help the sick. So he went to various hosp local hospitals in Italy and um, supposedly, you know, in trying to help out, miraculous healings occurred. Um, however, though, as a result of, uh, you know, helping the sick, he contracted the plague himself. And what's kind of interesting is he, believe it or not, then went into what was the 14th century or 15th century form of social social distancing um, and went into self-isolation in a cave outside of uh, the town where he was healing people. Um, and the story goes that a dog, which is kind of amazing, um, believe it or not, was bringing him food and would lick his wounds. Um, and is, he had a, underwent a miraculous healing. And so this is kind of an incredible story. And um, oftentimes uh, St. Rocco um, is invoked uh, by the faithful to, uh, you know, in times of plague, right? And as a protector against the plague. So the Scuola Grande de San Rocco, you know, this is 16th century, 15th century Italy. Um, you know, the plague is a very, very real threat. It's very um, recent memory. Um, and so here we have a group of lay people who decided to build this society, essentially, in honor of St. Rocco. So what I wanted to do is kind of show you some of the images within the Scuola Grande, um, which I think are really amazing, that illustrate sort of these stories from the life of St. Rocco. And so here we have, um, you know, an image by the great Venetian Renaissance artist Tintoretto uh, called St. Rocco in the hospital. And this is actually in the church. And this is like a larger than life panel, um, you know, that's maybe uh, 10 feet across or something like that. Um, and Tintoretto is really known for his incredibly dramatic uh, chiaroscuro style of painting. By chiaroscuro, we mean um, sort of this use of light and dark and high contrast in order to create drama within a painting. Um, and so what we see is, um, you know, this incredibly dramatic uh, canvas where here St. Rocco is in the center um, healing um, or attending to uh, someone who is suffering from uh, some sort of ailment. Um, and it's kind of meant to, of course, is meant to illustrate the, the figure for whom, you know, this entire, you know, complex, this church and um, this, uh, and the scuola have been built and dedicated to. So here we have an incredibly dramatic scene that is quintessential Tintoretto uh, here where we, and we know St. Rocco because of the halo that's around him as he's surrounded by those that are suffering. Um, and it's meant to be very, very consciously dramatic, starkly lit, um, because if you imagine, you know, you're seeing this, uh, you know, paint, you know, this painting, perhaps imagine it being lit by church light or by candlelight at night um, and be incredibly dramatic to experience um, and actually be create a visual image upon which people can invoke uh, St. Rocco um, in order to heal them. So it's an incredible image and Tintoretto, believe it or not, he was commissioned in about 1564 to decorate, begin decorating a series of, of, of uh, paintings um, dedicated to St. Rocco. Um, as well as other, you know, episodes from the Old and New Testament. Um, and they're really incredible. It's one of Tintoretto's great masterworks. And, you know, I hope, you know, before long, we'll be um, maybe back out in the world again, there you have an opportunity to visit this in person. So um, here's another image from Tintoretto. 
Um, this is St. Rocco in Glory. Um, and this one is actually inside the Scuola Grande. Um, so, and what we see here is a rather heroic, muscular looking St. Rocco. And he unfortunately died early from what we understand uh, around the age of Jesus, 33. Um, and here, so what we're, what we've been, rep what's been represented for us by Tintoretto is the moment upon which um, uh, Tintoretto has entered heaven, right? He's ascended, um, he's died and his soul has entered to heaven. However, he's represented here in a physical fleshly form. He's quite heroic looking. I mean, you know, he's sort of quite chiseled man. You can see his, um, his chest sort of clearly defined and he looks quite strong with that cape and that, you know, quite wonderful red garment. Um, and here he's being greeted by God, who's sort of flying in, you know, at the top of the composition um, and surrounded by Puti or, you know, baby angels um, and other angels um, in heaven. So what we're looking at actually is a painting that is done in the ceiling of the Scuola, which is kind of really amazing. Um, so again, imagine that you're a 16th century uh, Venetian and, uh, you know, we, we don't have, you know, the same type of media that we do now, and we're stepping back into the 16th century. And what we're seeing is a really um, amazing uh, image that's been created for us by a masterful Venetian artist. And so we're really overwhelmed by the majesty uh, that Tintoretto has created for us. And we're looking up at uh, the ceiling of the Scuola, and we're seeing this almost trompe l'oeil, right? This trick of the eye where this window to the heavens has been literally rend rendered and represented inside of the uh, inside of the, the Scuola. So it, it, imagine yourself again, a 16th century Venetian, and here you are um, being really introduced to this, you know, important, uh, incredible saint that's meant to be a protector of the plague. So this is literally um, the investment that people have made in artists, you know, to create images um, that are meant to offer hopeful messages in times and in threat of plague. So for now, I think this is actually going to kind of conclude the look at, you know, how artists have responded to the plague. There's incredible amount of um, examples of um, how artists have responded to, um, you know, to illness in different ways. But now, so I want to take a little bit of a turn and head over to uh, the, um, head over to how artists have come to terms with various uh, crises in terms of, uh, in economic terms. And so this might be a familiar image and we're, we're moving ahead granted about, you know, 400 years, four centuries, but, um, you know, I think that this image, when I talk a little bit more about it, perhaps some of you are familiar with it, um, is also an incredibly powerful image of our times. Um, and this is a, a photograph by Dorothea Lang, um, who's a really important, um, documentary photographer, uh, in the early and mid 20th century. Um, and so this photo was taken in 1936. Seven years earlier was uh, the stock market crash in 1929, which sort of signaled the beginning and the onset of the Great Depression, um, which of course was such a trying and tremendous um, lead taxing moment in the history of America um, when the economy collapsed. And so in, as part of the programs um, that were instituted by the federal government to help the country recover, um, there was the creation of agencies such as the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which actually uh, enlisted and hired artists to create works um, that would be, one, it would of course be, these would be real paying jobs, but also at the same time, these works would um, create hopeful messages that could be experienced by the people, notably murals, for instance, um, that would help uplift people during this trying economic time. So on the other hand, another agency was the, um, it later became known as the FSA, the Farm Securities Administration. And this was, uh, this administration was particularly dedicated um, towards um, supporting the plight of the rural poor uh, who were by and large farmers, for instance, um, and whose uh, economies were quite decimated during the Great Depression. So Dorothy, Dorothea Lang was actually one of these such photographers that was hired to, um, to document the plight of the rural poor. And so in the 1930s, after Dorothea Lang had been hired, she uh, basically was sort of on assignment to uh, document um, a migrant camp um, nor in Northern California, north of San Francisco in, in Nipomo, um, in Northern California, um, that would actually, uh, that was home to migrant pea pickers, believe it or not, um, who in, the, in this camp, they're sort of out of work um, and it's quite destitute conditions. And so Dorothea Lang actually goes and uh, starts taking pictures in this camp. And she so just so happens upon uh, this woman 
who is the mother of several children. Um, and, you know, she recalls a little bit about her experience of what it was like to run into this woman. Um, and she approached her and asked if she could take her photos. Um, and as a result, the image, though, is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, we see this woman who is both worried, but she's also strong at the same time. Somehow in, with this one image, uh, Dorothea Lang is able to capture um, this variety of, of, of emotional resonance. Um, I think it's really, it's really something that's quite gripping. I mean, we can see the two children that are truly leaning on her while she's also clutching a third child in her arms. Um, and she has her hand that's brought up to her face in such a gentle um, but uh, supportive kind of gesture that I think really, and she's looking off, gazing into the future, perhaps with uncertainty, but perhaps with a sense of reserve that she can get through this. Um, so Dorothea Lang was able to document, you know, this really iconic moment of the Great Depression. And then before long, believe it or not, it actually ended up in San Francisco newspapers. And so that was kind of amazing. And this image in turn became disseminated to a much wider public. And it really sort of rallied various people and politicians to supporting the cause of these migrant laborers um, who were really instrumental um, in making sure that the farm economy was running. So I think, again, this is a really amazing image. And this is an artist who actually is going out there in the public, documenting what people are experiencing, and then direct action is occurring that's actually uh, introducing positive change into the economy during the Great Depression. So um, what I want to do is we're talking about an iconic image with Dorothea Lange, but I actually, perhaps some of you might be quite familiar with the next image that's here on the slide. And that's because it's an image from our very own Queens LaGuardia Airport. Um, and what we're looking at actually um, is part, an excerpt of an incredible WPA mural. And this WPA mural was created by an artist named James Brooks. And I want to introduce it to you, one, because I think it's one of the great WPA murals of all time. Two, because it's something that you can actually go and experience, or maybe perhaps you have seen before, because it's in the Marine Air Terminal at LaGuardia Airport. And believe it or not, it's one of um, the it's one of the, um, it's actually one of the largest WPA murals in existence. Um, it's, it, it sort of travels around the rotunda of the Marine Air Terminal, and it's over 220 feet long, which I think is just absolutely amazing. And I really encourage you, if you haven't seen it yet, um, and you happen to maybe live in Queens, and you can just pop by, it really is spectacular. Um, and so what James Brooks is, you know, LaGuardia was actually um, constructed as a result of uh, you know, in the middle of the, the Great Depression, I believe, was part of the Works Progress Administration um, and the New Deal, and it was actually constructed in New York. Um, and as a result, the WPA mural, uh, this mural was commissioned by James Brooks. And the idea is that it's illustrating the achievements of humankind throughout history, and in particular, as it relates to flight. So if we take a look, there's a couple really great scenes. Actually, we'll go back first. Um, that we can look at here, for instance, is the myth of Icarus. Um, perhaps some of you uh, might be familiar with it. Um, uh, the classical myth where Icarus, whose wings, they're made of feathers and wax, and he flies too close to the sun. Um, and then we go from then all the way, you know, here to Leonardo and his amazing uh, flight-related inventions. And they become manifest in this incredible form of abstract shapes that almost look like Alexander Calder mobiles. I mean, they're really amazing. Um, so here we have this artist, James Brooks, who is showing this sort of story about the history of flight and is really, um, it's really incredible. And it's meant to uplift those who see it to see, look, you know, humankind has achieved some really incredible things throughout history. And so that's something that we can all look forward to, um, even though that this might be, you know, towards the tail end of a darker time of America's history. Uh, amazing things have happened historically. Um, people have built incredible technological achievements, flight among them, and it's part of this much larger human story. And so this is something that I think is also interesting and relevant because, you know, while obviously there are a lot of um, this incredibly trying time, right, um, I think we, you know, to a certain degree have to understand that, you know, modern technology is also really important. I mean, the way that we're just brought together like this in this moment, virtually um, through our computers and through our cell phones and these sorts of things. So I think that there's something to be said that is really quite interesting um, about thinking about this work in relationship to the now. So, um, and before, you know, moving on a little bit more, I just wanted to point out what we have here is another scene, it's another detail. Um, and what we have is the Wright brothers 
um, is who we're looking at, you know, this detail and incredible art, you know, art deco almost type lettering of the departures with like the insignias and the doorways and the, you know, the marble walls. It's really, I mean, it's really incredible design. I mean, great mid-century design. And, you know, we have the Wright brothers, of course, you know, down in Kitty Hawk experimenting with their, you know, the first true airplane. And then, you know, again, to the left, we have this incredible vignette of these uh, abstract forms that are kind of, you know, they're evoking, you know, flight patterns or air currents or things like this. It's really, um, I think this is one of the great WPA murals. And um, if you haven't seen it yet, please do. It really is amazing. And so I really just briefly, I wanted to bring us up to the present day. And then before concluding, we'll take a look at how the Yay Art Gallery, believe it or not, sort of incidentally found itself um, with exhibitions that really relate to what we're all going through now. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, the visual culture around the pandemic that future historians will be looking at to try to understand what it is that people were going through, what they believed now, what, you know, what, what challenges they were facing, um, that visual culture is being created now. And so I just wanted to show you all um, this New Yorker cover that recently came out, which I thought was incredibly gripping, an illustration by Owen Smith, which is titled After the Shift. You know, and here we have an incredibly almost exhausted, uh, uh, you know, uh, medical worker, you know, frontline medical worker who's waiting for the subway to get home. And so I think it's a really interesting image to look at, and it'll be the type of imagery that we can expect from artists and creatives. I and mean, there's all sorts of things. Some will, of course, be, you know, more illustrative, such as the swan. Some will be more didactic. Others will be more abstract. Um, so I think it's really interesting to think about how the visual culture around the pandemic is being created now. Um, and it's, I think, worth looking at. And then, of course, when we have a benefit of historical distance, we can go and try to understand, well, what were people feeling? What were they thinking? How are they behaving? How are they acting? So um, before concluding, I wanted to share, um, bring us back to St. John's, um, which I think is, is kind of really exciting. And, and here we are standing in the Yay Art Gallery in Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hall. Um, hopefully some of you have been there. And if not, when all of this is over, I would happily welcome you uh, to the gallery for a tour. Um, and what we're looking at is uh, an installation view of one of the exhibitions. It's actually up right now still. Um, it was, it's supposed to close May 1, but you know um, we haven't been there since March, but the exhibition is actually still up now uh, by a Chinese artist who's living in New York named Chen Dong Fan. Uh, and this exhibition is titled Sanctuary. And um, while this exhibition was very much in uh, being planned, uh, you know, as early as last summer, I think, because I started and uh, around this time last year, and I took a couple of months to get my, my feet wet, so to speak, and then I really started planning what we were going to be doing in the future. Here we have an example of, um, you know, this is, you know, an exhibition that was developed in June, but it kind of ended up taking on a really interesting uh, a, a meanings that were unintentional, that sort of just happened because of the change in the historical context in which this exhibition was displayed. And, you know, this is, you know, this exhibition opened January 30th, it opened after Chinese New Year, and it opened sort of really when the moment um, when the epidemic in, in Wuhan and in China was really kind of peaking. And so here you have an artist who has family back home, who has friends back home. And what he wanted to do with this exhibition before all of this happened was to play with this idea of sanctuary. He was really interested in the fact that St. John's is a Catholic university um, and the idea that, you know, there's a church on campus, for instance and how there's this idea of a spiritual sanctuary that of course is part of St. John's. And also he wanted to kind of marry that with the idea of the artist studio as a private sanctuary, um, as a private creative space, or the idea of the sanctuary of the mind that one can find sanctuary in an inner creative mental space. And so he was really interested in creating works um, that you know, respond to this idea of sanctuary and actually create a type of sanctuary. So then, you know, for, for him and for other students at St. John's and for the community, is he was really interested in how this art gallery can become a type of sanctuary. And I think now, you know, this, is, this idea of sanctuary is something that we would all, you know, we all are pretty, really drawn to. I know I am, just because the world is so difficult and challenging right now. So here we have an artist who's offering a very positive kind of environment for people to come and experience a type of solitude, um, a type of reflection, um, a type of sanctuary. So the work that we're looking at that's all the way in the back, which we'll zoom in on now, um, is actually was a blackboard that the artist created called uh, the Sanctuary Club. And I really loved this work. Um, and believe it or not, it was a blackboard where, you know, the artist, you know, started with a little bit of thoughts. And in the previous slide, it, it kind of looked empty. And that's because the artist had just added a couple of things. But here the artist has 
you know, he started adding a few things. And um, then what's really wonderful is there's a little chalk box to the right there is students, visitors, whoever were invited to come and add their own messages that they wanted to share, their own thoughts that they wanted to write down. And what was really interesting is, you know, for instance, as things were getting worse in, in China and in Europe, you start seeing um, people, you know, writing hopeful messages to each other. Um, after Kobe Bryant, you know, sadly, very tragically passed away, um, you have students, you know, writing tributes to, to Kobe, uh, which I thought was also really interesting. So a lot of times, um, you know, students themselves were actually using this as a really interesting, uh, you know, place where they can write their thoughts, their hopes, their wishes, those sorts of things. And there even was a really wonderful representation of a Pieta down here. Um, you know, the famous statue by Michelangelo of Mary holding um, Jesus, who's come down from the, uh, who's come down from the cross, um, which I thought was really amazing, created by my uh, students in my art history survey. I'm really proud of them. So, and then briefly before concluding, um, I just wanted to also point out one of the other exhibitions we have up, which is by a Chilean artist named Patricia Dominguez. Um, and what Patricia was doing, this is a three channel video installation. So we th see three television monitors in one of the gallery. Um, and what she was doing was actually creating uh, a video that looks at how in Chile, um, indigenous people um, sort of intertwined um, European religious beliefs with their own um, to create actually an investigate history of how people have healed with roses, um, which is I think something really interesting. Um, and she was really thinking about this because um, if you remember in the 19th century, that's when the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe happened in Mexico. And she was, um, I think, standing or surrounded by uh, visions of roses. Um, and as a result, roses took on this really interesting uh, healing, this, this association with healing. Um, so she created a whole video that actually engaged with that um, in different ways. And she, we can see she actually created a little altar up front. Um, that had lots of roses and, and bits of food and these sorts of things displayed. So she's really looking at how, you know, people in her native Chile um, were sort of, you know, integrated, uh, you know, uh, both indigenous local traditions with Catholicism um, to create, you know, this video that's about the history of healing and its practices today. So, you know, that being said, I just want to thank you. I want to thank Susan. Um, it was really, really wonderful getting this opportunity to share, you know, how I think artists can offer hopeful messages to everyone during this very difficult time, as well as what the gallery has been doing. Um, you know, I really hope that we can stay in touch. You know, Susan and I were joking, you know, for instance, anyone out there has any art and they want to do a virtual collection visit, you know, such as Susan, there she is. Yeah, I've um, got the Degas, you know, in the background, um, which I think is really great. You know, happy, would love to see what you all have in your home. Could be like a virtual antiques roadshow, might be quite fun. Um, so I really hope we have an opportunity to connect, you know, during this time where we're all in our respective um, different places of self-isolation. Please get in touch. My email address is here. Um, and also if you're on Facebook, feel free to follow us on Facebook. We're pretty active there as well. So thank you all for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. So, I think you're on mute, Susan. Susan, I think you're on mute. Um, I can't hear you. Sorry, I am on mute. There you go. Thank you. There we go. If anyone has any questions, you can type it in the chat box. Do you have any questions for Owen? I think it would be great to do the, the virtual antique roadshow. Oh, yeah, that yeah, would be fabulous, everybody. Over okay. the summer, we can show our, our art. Yeah. And, you know, it's always interesting to see, you know, what people collect when I go and visit uh, alumni at their homes. Everybody has fabulous collections. Oh, that's cool. And stories and stories about their travels and how it's connected, yeah. uh, you know, to the pieces of art. It's yeah. always interesting to see. Yeah. And we got we got a question about how do you see okay. um, human connectivity playing into post-corona art? Oh man, that's interesting. Um, okay. what, what are people going to make and how's it going to relate to how we connect, um, you know, as humans? Um, one, I think there's two things that I, I think I'll just briefly talk about that are really interesting. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I really think is one, how is socialization going to change, you know, after all of this, you know, the art gallery, it's about a place where you go. Yeah, you can go there and have individual experiences, but you can go there and um, you know, be with friends, it's a social activity. 
openings are really fun celebrations. They're really fun events. So I think that's definitely going to change. And I think people are really going to miss in some ways just being with each other um, and thinking about how artists might creatively deal with that will be interesting. Um, one artist that I'll, I'll type in I'll type into the chat that I suggest everyone um, look up. Um, his name is Adad Hana. Um, and it's called the, I think it's called the social distancing portraits. Um, and if you Google them, they're really, um, uh, they're kind of, they're really amazing. Um, and the, this idea of the, the social distancing portraits is they're basically these videos of people who are just trying to stand still as long as they can. And he's taken them, you know, uh, they're really beautiful has taken them just, you know, out and about walk as long as walks and of course staying six feet from people and approaching them and asking mm -hmm. if you can videotape them and they can, you know, stand still as long as possible. So I think that's actually a really interesting question. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to answer any other ones. You see any others? Some are popping up on my screen and some aren't. I, I don't have I don't I don't have any oh, social distancing. Do you see that one? Social distancing portraits. Yeah, that's fine. I just added that. Oh, uh, okay. So they, All can, right. so they can look up this artist and see what I mean. Oh, okay. Um, if you're seeing questions, um, Susan, perhaps you can you might be able to read them because um, they might have been sent directly to you. Yeah, I don't. I see one that says, "How do you see? Do we?" You, yeah, I did just you did that. Answer that one. You yeah. just answered that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see. Don't see any others coming my way. Okay. Do you okay. see any on your oh, end? Go. I got another one. Oh wait, there's another oh, one just now. Yeah, Is this yeah, presentation? Yeah. Okay. Here we. Okay. There we oh, go. Gosh. Okay. Oh, these are great. Okay. Um, is this presentation going to be available yeah, soon? Yeah, it's going mm -hmm. to be online. Um, and this is actually a really good question that I think brings up other issues related to. Um, well, one, yes, it's going to be posted on YouTube, so it's going to be available to students. Um, and also at the same time, it'll be available to the wider public. So please feel free once it's up on YouTube, you'll get a link to it and you can share it. Um, and then also we're coming up the gallery, so stay tuned um, because, you know, the gallery is coming up with ways of um, being able to engage our audiences, um, which I think is kind of great. Um, There's another one about Dorothea Lang. Yeah, documentary photography intersecting with consents. That you can write, <laughs> you can write books about that whole thing. Um, <laughs> it's kind of great. Uh, uh, you know, approaching your, um, uh, you know, approaching your, uh, you know, your your subject and asking them, can I take your picture? Um, and actually, I mean, it's it's interesting. Um, I mean, it's a complicated issue. I suppose you're supposed to have it, right? Like you're supposed to, the, your subject is supposed to agree to have their photo taken. Obviously, that doesn't happen really as much anymore because we all are walking around with cameras. But the story, at least you can tell the story around Dorothea Lang getting consent um, of her subject in this case is quite quite interesting. And I actually have the, a quote from her right here that I can read. That's kind of nice because I was brushing up a little bit before the. Um, the presentation. And she said, I saw an approach to hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I remember she asked me no questions, which wonders was she even aware of like such a right. um, <laughs> uh, I made five exposures walking closer and closer from the same direction. There she sat in that lean, uh, in that lean to tent with her children huddled around her. And she seemed to know that my pictures might help her. And so she helped me. So that's a little like, you know, it's not hearing like we had this conversation and some people when they're, you know, documented photographers now, um, part of the photograph is really part of the process of social engagement and social interaction with their subject and trying to actually have a real connection um, with someone who's experiencing something incredibly different than the photographer. Um, so here we have an example of, um, it's kind of, you know, retrospect, well, I mean, the, the photograph had a lot to, you know, was able to have a great impact, which is interesting, but, you know, it's kind of interesting to, to think about. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a great question. That is a good question. Yeah. How, ooh, how do you see COVID affecting our, COVID the, affecting oh right, God, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, I, you know, um, well, there's different ways. I think artists are really affected by this because so many artists are freelancers. You know, that's something that I can, uh, I know from uh, experience is a lot of people are, are freelancers and they're really, 
um, uh, you know, so people are, are, are suffering economically right now that are artists, most are. Um, even if you are a fairly established artist that sells your paintings for ten, twenty thousand dollars, all of a sudden, you know, you know, you're not selling anything right now. So mm. people's incomes are really stopping. So I think it'll be interesting to see who, how are, um, you know, when galleries shut down, museums shut down. I mean, hopefully everything will be able to bounce back, but we don't know. So I think people are going to have to be more resourceful with their creativity. Um, it's going to, people are going to be creating perhaps more, um, less for this like commercial success and maybe more for the love of it because you mm. are just, you know, you're at home and what else can you do? Um, or you're, you, you know, it's, it'll be more, uh, even more personal endeavor. Um, oh my gosh, there's so it many, all these even questions. more interesting art, right? Coming through because of the passion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so because people yeah. are coming to share what they're going through. Um, I think yeah. it, there's so many. I mean, it's such a big question that you could go in many different directions. Um, okay, we want to get to question. Yeah, since we're all in quarantine, how will the creativity flow? It'll be up to each and every one of us <laughs> for finding our own internal creativity. That's the best I can. How will museums survive? Um, mm -hmm. That's a good question. If they have big endowments, they'll be okay. If they don't, they'll de need government support of some kind. Um, yeah. And it's even more challenging because if some museums are are dependent on earned revenue, i.e. ticket sales, people have talked about the Tenement Museum, um, they will be really challenged. Um, you know, luckily the EA Art Gallery is a part of St. John's University, um, you know, and so obviously we're dependent on the university for, for, for our funding. So we're, we probably have a little bit of a cushion compared to, um, I mean, obviously things are gonna be challenging for the university, but we're in a better place than a museum that's dependent on its ticket sales, for instance, we don't sell tickets. Yeah. Um, so that will be interesting to see. Um, big museums like the Met, the Whitney, New York City is not going to let them go under because that's why tourists come to New York City. Is to go see the, the masterpieces at the Met, to go to the opera, yeah. to go to those things. So those things aren't going to be um, those things aren't going to go anywhere. I think what'll be challenging is those museums that are on a, already on a bit of a tight shoestring budget mm -hmm. and they won't respond. Right. If a version of the WPA was to be resurrected right. as a stimulus for artists, well, would uh, what would I guess you want yeah, like to come out of it in terms of public art? Public art, art. good yeah. public art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, I, I think in terms of public art, um, I think it, you know, there's a couple ways you could go about it. One, you could, you know, entrust it to eventually to local communities. So allowing people that are um, specific, like if you're in Richmond, Virginia versus Des Moines, Iowa, you know, or, or that sort of thing, you're, you know, you're delegating the creation of public art to a local community based on their needs. Um, but I think um if there were great committees set up of people that are actually leaders in their field and understand um the power of public art um, and how it can be successful and uplifting um i think that that would be uh you know i think it, I, i'm not so sure in terms of what i'd like to see in terms of actual art um but as a, a museum administrator i'd like to see if that happens the system in place ensuring that the outcome is tailored to a specific location and is really good at the same time um, wow, these are good questions. Yeah, um, very good questions. Yeah. So, um, yeah. and do you do you have any others that are maybe directed towards you? No, I don't see anything. Although I have to say, today the chat is a little awkward for some reason. I don't know. Usually, I see it a lot clearly. Uh, but now I'm just I'm just scrolling through again to see if we missed anything. But I think we have everybody. Oh, I see. Okay, wait. Oh, okay. See another well, I got another one. Ken, Ken Dow sent one. Okay, I see another one. Um, I don't even aware? see that. Isn't that funny? Yeah, I got yeah. it. Um, are you aware of any art that came out of the 1918 Spanish flu episode? Well, this is really yeah. interesting. And, you know, it's um, people actually are revisiting this now and trying to rethink uh, the Spanish flu. And art historians have for a while assumed that artists sort of for some reason weren't necessarily dealing with it in such a direct way because maybe because it was on world war one was ongoing and perhaps that was more um uh uh more um uh more pressing more, more pressing to people but what, what actually is there's a recent article that came out in art forum is a publication by an art historian named michael lobel who's at hunter college in new york city and he's actually arguing um you know that you need to re revisit 
if you revisit works that we're dealing with World War I, you can actually interpret them as very much related to the Spanish flu. And there's a great John Singer Sargent painting, um, you know, one of the early American modernists um, that deals, with, it's called GASSED, I think is the G-A-S-S-E-D, and it shows frontline soldiers on uh, entrenched warfare in Europe. Um, and it actually, um, there's an interpretation of it as being very responsive to the Spanish flu. So artists definitely have, I think people are now going to start looking at that because mm. you know, it was such a cataclysmic event and we're, we all now have a familiarity of what it's like to maybe experiencing something like that. So I think people are going to go back um, and take a look at it as well. Um, I'm trying to it's see. Here. I don't see anything here. I want to make sure we're on time. Yeah. We, still have, we still have a couple more minutes if anyone has additional questions for Owen. Yeah. So happy to. Do you have any um, exhibitions that you were planning? Oh, if you gosh. can give us a little sneak a, preview what, uh, what's coming up, or do you yeah. have anything? Um, you know, um, it's Are you allowed to tell us. Uh, and yeah, I mean, <laughs> You know, um, that's a good question. Um, do tell, do tell. So, I, I mean, just right now, we're just waiting to see what happens. Um, you know, we're going to follow what St. John's does, of course, in terms of the mm -hmm. guidelines, and we're going to follow what other cultural institutions are doing at St. John's because we're, uh, you know, we're not, we're a space for students and for the academic community of St. John's, but we're a space right. for the public as well. And so, um, you know, we have, we're going to be doing two solo exhibitions in the fall. Um, and that's where we're scheduled. They haven't quite been announced yet. And we're, we're I, I kind of hesitate because I just don't know what we're doing yet. And they might get, I know it's so hard. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, we are, you know, at, at one point, you know, we're, I just want to kind of, you know, we are planning next spring though. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, in next year, we're going to be doing lots of different shows. One thing we're going to be doing is taking the BFA exhibition online. But, um, which I think will be really Good. interesting. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Maybe Susan can send that out to everyone so we can, in a way, we can show um, the great work of our students um, to a wider audience. Um, and I had another, I had another question that was that was texted to me actually by someone, <laughs> um, which is kind of really great. Um, if I had to choose, oh, there it is. It just popped up. Hey, you have um, something, yeah. Hey, Laura, um, is that one of One artwork to be your plague altarpiece, what would it be? Oh my gosh, it's, if I had to, <laughs> That's so hard. That's such a great question. Um, what would we, um, so, okay. If, if anyone's interested in like what, um, you know, the, the, the kids, the millennial artists, young, very young avant-garde creative artists are up to, um, there's an artist, um, she's a, a, a Moroccan artist based in New York named Miriam Banani. Um, and she's been creating the series of digitally made videos while she's in quarantine. Um, that follow these two lizards through this. They're basically experiencing all the things that we're experiencing, but they're these digital, mm -hmm. like, they're like, they look like the Geico geckos almost, uh, <laughs> but, they have, but they have face masks on. It's kind of amazing. And they're experiencing, they're just like driving in the city when no one's around. They have friends who are healthcare workers that are, you know, going through really hard times. So it, it's kind of amazing and how it, you know, by yeah. using animals in a way, it sort of really, um, um, uh, you know, it, it almost like, creates this, lets us see this experience from a sense of distance because they're not people, they're right. animals. So we can right. laugh at it, we can mm -hmm. you know, um, take it seriously, but not at the same time. And so I can actually... Um, uh, and you have another question too. Do you yeah, see it? How do you right. see, do you see that one? Uh, ooh, no, I, I don't um, know. I that Tamara, one. how do you see AR, VR playing gosh, into gosh. how people are currently experiencing yeah. art and how do we create authentic experiences oh my gosh uh that is hard um how um interesting so i mean it's useful you know i i, I feel like we're kind of inundated with a, like if anyone is for instance uh you know subscribes to newsletters from arts organizations um you know it's really kind of amazing to see how uh, you know, we're getting all these emails being like, join this virtual webinar, I'll take this virtual tour. I think these things are all important, but I wonder if there's like a threshold where we're all of a sudden this summer, we're just like, no more Zoom, no more anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think maybe, you know, it's going to be important, right? People are going to have to know how to do these things there. I mean, I'm probably going to be, if, if we do have our exhibitions in the fall, 
as soon as I can, I'm probably going to take really good documentation of them in case we have to transition online. Um, I think that will be something that'll be kind of interesting because, um, you know, uh, we might need to, you know, so I, yes. I think everyone will be prepared. Well, as soon as mm -hmm. they can, they're going to right. adopt to these things, mm -hmm. but also at the same time, I don't know, I might get tired of, of looking at an online exhibition or being right. as part of a webinar. I might just want to, I want to go read a book and do a crossword puzzle for like a week. That'll probably oh, no. be my vacation this summer. Right. Like it's like, I'm turning out, turning everything off and I'm just going to do crossword puzzles. And well, I could stuff. totally relate. And you can join me for my uh, Susan's uh, road show because Susan's I'm getting to the point where I am. I think it's great. You know, like I said, the pen, wow, yeah. it's terrific. We're all interfacing at the computer, yeah. but I know in several months, I'm really going to be tired of the computer Probably, so right. i'm going to be calling people up and saying i'm coming door to door and we're going to have a door to door visit nigel's already going to come and play some music for everybody you can come and bring some artwork or an exhibit yeah. and we could do this all in their driveway it'll be yeah. lots of it'll fun be great it'll be great you have to be creative now's the time to really be creative and and the way we approach people once we're you know it's it's okay for people to start connecting again, I think one-on-one -on -one connection is going to be really important. Mm. I think it's also going to be legislated in some ways, because when you go to a restaurant, you're not going to be able to go with like a group of 20 people, you know, and, mm. you know, no. it's, it's really going to be one-on-one -on -one connection, I think is going to be really mm -hmm. important. In addition to people finding, you know, it'll probably for the next 18 months, it'll be like a hybrid of, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, type you of, do that with the gallery, and you could do a one-on-one -on -one experience, right? Yeah, so I mean, there's, like, for, in, for instance, yeah. at St. John's, there are great classes on interactive design, and you know, mm -hmm. and perhaps there there's places for partnerships where students can actually help produce some of those um, that content and those experiences. So it's that interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's terrific. I think you got one more question, and then we'll have to close okay, we'll it. One more. Do you see it? I don't know if I see it. I, yes. I saw something pop up. I don't know why today. I can't. It's not coming out very clearly, uh, those questions. Okay, I think. I don't know. I think I is think that's that, it. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. I think that's it. Oh, okay. and I can't thank you enough. This was wonderful. I hope Good. everyone enjoyed it as much as myself. And I hope they felt that they were in a museum somewhere in Europe where yeah. they, you know, just, you know, for some time being, we just, you know, escaped. This was yeah. a beautiful, wonderful escape. And I appreciate yeah. you sharing your talents with everyone today. Uh, stay tuned, next Tuesday we have another Power Hour. Uh, I've invited my uh, holistic physical therapist to come <laughs> join us, Carolyn Knopf. She is a healer, she is really amazing, a uh, very unique physical therapist, but she's also going to help us uh, during this time with, uh, with our well-being. So I think she'll be really, really interesting and fascinating. And I hope you join us next Tuesday at one o'clock. Uh, when we can get back on campus, by all means, come visit, you know, Owen and his wonderful gallery. And as you can see, he has a lot of things uh, in the works uh, and hopefully we can see it in person. I really, I pray for that. I pray for everyone staying healthy and to be well. And, um, you know, what can I say? Just, we just have to pray that all of this will soon be behind us but it's certainly an experience and as you can you know tell from your from your um presentation that even though some bad things good things come out of it uh and those beautiful works of art uh you know and the healing that it can do for us so thank you for showing that up uh, you're showing this to us uh, yeah. and i'll be going on the museum uh actually in our in our e-newsletter we um, connected everyone to all the different museum sites so that they can go and they have these wonderful virtual shows. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've seen any of them, but they really are terrific. So it's great that you could see so many museums in one day yeah. if you wanted, you know. So yeah. that's what's nice too. So thank you. I can't wait for you to come back to New York. Yeah, me too. Anyway, <laughs> well, well, thank you, Susan, and thank Thanks you everyone so. for joining us. Thank okay. you, everyone. Please have a good time. day. Take Bye -bye. care. God bless.